It's uh, Brother Gavin James. He was born in Gallia. Gallia. I knew I was going to mess that up. Gallia County, Ohio, in April 9, 1985. He currently resides in Gallia County, serving as the Rio Grande Church of Christ, serving them, and also as a Bible teacher for teenagers, and works as a campus minister for the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College. He broadcasts Reasons I Believe weekly on the college cable channel each semester to the campus and surrounding community, including Rio Grande, Wellston, and Jackson in Ohio. Gavin looks forward to graduating with a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Rio Grande in May of 2015. He and his wife Kelly were married in 2008 and are raising two children together. He is a 2012 graduate of West Virginia School of Preaching. We're going to invite him and come and speak to us on the topic of the new commandment. Brother. As a first time speaker, I want to thank the elders of the Hillview Terrace congregation and also the director and the teachers here at the West Virginia School of Preaching. Um, this is a time of year a lot of people are more interested in talking about fear and that sort of thing, not just for the Halloween approaching, but also the news. You look at terrorist groups and disease outbreaks and that sort of thing. But luckily, the Apostle John tells us in his epistles that perfect love casts out all fear, and we need to move fear out of the way and make room for love. As the New Commandment states that Jesus gives in John 13 and 15, love one another. If I wasn't here, I'd still be kind of thinking about love. I've got a marriage ceremony I have to officiate later this week for a pair of friends. That makes it number three as far as since I've graduated from the school of preaching and been doing that capacity for some friends. The first time I officiated a marriage ceremony, it was for a friend of mine from high school, and he ended up marrying a woman who, uh, her family is Jewish, so we ended up having a secular ceremony with some Jewish traditions. And that was quite an experience, to say the least. But without going into that, I wanted to make a big speech and make a big you know, impact, so I wrote a little thing at the beginning to introduce the wedding ceremony and I talked about how love isn't really restricted to a philosophy or belief system or worldview. That's something that all people everywhere can appreciate, that love is universal. Of course, then I get this assignment and I see that there's a certain type of love. There's no greater love. Jesus says love would be the distinguishing feature. People will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And I had to try to, I guess, either take back one statement or harmonize both of them. And I think I can. So before we understand that love is the foundation of the Christian faith, it's the foundation of Christian fellowship, we have to understand there are different types of love. You can base your life on religious teachings, but Jesus talked about two different kinds, at least. Some are that sand, they're not very stable, not very sturdy, and some are the solid rock, some are based on truth. I think in the same way we can talk about love, there's different things that we call love, there's different types of love. Love is an emotion for some people, it can be fleeting, it can be fickle, and that's the kind of thing most people will think, well how could you possibly command that? How could you command someone to feel a certain way? I read an article recently, scientists say that when certain of your brain cells get excited when you're in contact with, when you're in contact with someone, whether you're holding hands or whatever, and I think that's a really strict definition. And it doesn't take into account when we say a young man's in love, we think of him constantly thinking of this girl or him having this desire to want to be with them. And we call that love too, so I don't think that definition works. I talk a little bit in the manuscript about false notions about love, how it's so prevalent in certain religious teachings that if you have love, then truth becomes irrelevant, truth becomes unimportant. I want to point out 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love rejoices in truth. If love is more important than truth, then there really is no reason to believe that God is love. There is no reason to believe that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. And love without truth really, at its core, loses its core. It's a self-defeating proposition. If it's true that love is more important than truth, then 
I don't really have to believe that, do I? It's just like saying, if there's no objective truth, then there's no harm in believing that there is objective truth. But I think ultimately what we will come to realize is that love is really manifested in action. I quote Leon Barnes, a Christian may not always feel loving, but a Christian should always act in a loving manner, to paraphrase a little bit. It's one thing to tell someone that their beliefs or their traditions don't make sense, but at the same time, well, with the world's emphasizing truth without love, if we're going to have love, we need truth too. Or maybe I got that backwards. But we have to speak the truth in love. We have to show them the way of God more accurately. In 2 Timothy, this is the advice that Paul gives Timothy in verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, willing to pick a fight, so to speak, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So truth and love are not incompatible. Truth and love have to go together. And in a great sense, they're just as important as the other. So if love is the foundation, we look at the reason that Jesus brought this to their attention, brought this commandment to his disciples' attention, because they were all wanting to know who would be first, which one of them is going to be the first in the kingdom of God. It's evident not necessarily from that chapter in the Gospel of John, but from the other Gospels and by trying to harmonize what was going on. Here they were gathering together, getting ready to have the feast, and they were wanting to know who would be the greatest, who would be the best in the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's no doubt who the greatest actually was, the one who brought them together, the one who chose them to be his disciples, but it's interesting to note that the Son of God took up a town and basin and washed off the feet of his own disciples. If you want to know what his message was, I think it comes out in Luke 22, starting in verse 24. In Luke 22, starting in verse 24, he, he explains to them, Jesus explains to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. He's making a point. This is not the way that you're going to be treating others in the kingdom. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, let the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves. Love is very important for all Christians, but I think here it takes a very special meaning for those who would be leaders in the church that Christ would establish, for the apostles here and for elders and deacons throughout time. Bishops themselves are called to be stewards, according to Titus 1.7, and to follow the same example, not necessarily to be served, but to serve, even in their position of authority, spiritual authority. We have to remember that the church is Christ and not belong to any other man. Another thing to think about when we talk about love is who chose these disciples, and the answer is obviously Christ. But then if we think about love, we think about Christ is choosing who I have to love. Among the disciples, Christ chose these disciples, and these disciples might not have come together in any other way and had anything in common other than their willingness to follow Christ, except for one, of course. Many times in your life, you don't have a choice in who you love, and I think this is a romantic idea. It comes from ideas of chivalry and feudalism, and it's uh, affected us today that we have to choose someone, we have to choose the right person to love, and in, re in romantic relationships that might be the case, but there's many people in your life you didn't choose to love. Think of your family, think of your children if you have children, or if you ever will have children. You don't choose your children, you don't choose the kind of personality they have, you don't choose their likes and dislikes, but you love them anyway and unconditionally. We're commanded to love our neighbors, we might choose where we live, but we don't necessarily know when we go into that situation who our neighbors will be. Of course, Christ has a much broader scope for who our neighbors are, according to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Arranged marriages were always the way of history and still are in some countries, yet that does not mean that love was impossible when spouses were chosen for them. 
in some way, I think the reason people turn away from God because this isn't the God they would choose. This isn't the God that they would make up for themselves, and that's what leads to idolatry. It might just be this idea that we have to choose the God whom we serve. But I think the more we learn about God, the more we ought to love God. We can't choose God for ourselves. There is only one God, one God who we know through his revelation and nature and his word, and choice has nothing to do with it other than we choose to learn more about him and grow in love for him or we do not. As far as skeptics go, some might say, well, why is Christ telling his disciples to only love one another? Why shouldn't they love other people? And obviously the answer is yes. But the old adage goes that charity begins at home. John said, if you can't love your brother who you've seen, how can you love God who you haven't seen? And I think we can use the same logic. If you can't love your brother, how can you show love to so many who need to understand God's love for them outside the body of Christ? If you can't love someone of the same like precious faith, how can you bring yourself to love someone of a different faith or a different background of any sort? And so often we think that we are only supposed to love our brothers and sisters who are loving and kind toward us. And Christ doesn't limit it in that sense. Matthew 5.46, he says, If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors, the publicans, the sinners do the same? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You love me and I'll treat you in a loving fashion. But that's not what Christ commands us to do. No matter what our brothers and sisters would say or do to us, we have to treat them in a loving manner, regardless of how we feel about what they do or hurt feelings or anything like that. I think this all goes back to trying to be first in a relationship. No matter what kind of relationship it is, when you try to put yourself first, you sabotage that relationship. I'm going to put that disclaimer out. I'm not an expert on marriage, but I read things now and again. People think marriage is 50-50, and I read something the other day. No, divorce is 50-50. You give 100%, your spouse gives 100%. You both get 100%. You don't settle for half. When you put someone else first and they do the same, you get 100%. And I think that doesn't just apply to marriage. It doesn't just apply to friendship. Think about the church. Don't ask what the congregation can do for you. Ask what you can do for the congregation, to paraphrase JFK a little bit. People say, well, the church doesn't do anything for me. Well, it's not about that. It's not just about that. It's what are you doing? What are you putting into it? What are you willing to do for God and for the church? I thought it was interesting that the text assigned dealt with Judas Iscariot and his identity as betrayer. At first I thought it would be enough just to say that Judas Iscariot, that's a good example. This is how someone who doesn't love Christ, who doesn't love God, would act and how he would treat his Lord. Jesus talked about the love of many waxing cold, and when he spoke those words earlier in the week, Jesus Iscariot may have already experienced that. Christ spoke of many offenses and hatred and betrayal that would exist among the apostles, and it was the kind of love that if they would have for one another, this could be avoided as much as possible. The greater lesson isn't just a negative example, like this is how not to love. Think about how Christ felt for Judas, how much he loved him, even on the same night, he would be betrayed. I don't think Jesus ever stopped loving him. John was there. He was close to Jesus, seated next to him, because he wanted to be. He was called the disciple who Jesus loved, not because Jesus loved him more than any others, not because Jesus played favorites, but because John seemed to return that love in a special way. And he was there beside Jesus. But Judas, it didn't seem, would return that love at least in his actions. Judas was, John was there because Jesus loved him. Judas was there because Jesus loved him. As far as the seeing arrangement goes, the rest is not important. A lot of people and commentators like to bicker and try to get details that I don't think we can know. But I think it is important to understand the passage about how Judas is identified and who he's identified to. I remember seeing this in Hollywood in some movie where Jesus tells all the disciples, well, whoever dips his bread with me 
is going to betray me. And Judas is looking out the window. He dips his bread, not paying a world of attention. And that explains, you know, why he would reveal himself, because he wasn't paying attention. But let's get that idea out of our head. Because I really think, based on what can be studied, Jesus identified Judas. He let him know that he knew he was going to betray him. He let John know that Judas was the one to betray him, but I don't think any of the other apostles knew. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And the key here is, I use the word forbearance, and I stretch the meaning of the word patience and long-suffering as far as love goes, as far as being loving. I go for, as far as to say, patience doesn't mean waiting a long time. Sometimes you have to give up your own desires. Think about Saul of Tarsus, how he was persecuting the church. And then when he recognized the error of his ways, you know, his way of expressing love wasn't, well, he would have to wait a long time before he'd ever start persecuting the church again. No, he would have to stop doing that. Can't be a living sacrifice and always get things your way. So I think, well, I'm really talking about a sacrifice, and that requires much patience and fortitude to do the kind of sacrifice it takes to maintain true love. Because if we have a definition of love that's as true and as ideal as it can be without sacrifice, then we're not talking about the kind of love Christ is talking about here. The disciples had learned some measure of love, and I find it interesting. Christ says, one of you will betray me. If I said someone here is going to be put in prison by the end of the night, then someone might start looking back and forth, wondering, well, who is it? I wonder if it's him. I, I bet it's her, or that sort of thing. But none of the disciples accused each other. They took turns asking Jesus, is it I? Is it I, if you read the Gospel of Matthew and the others? It's a self-examination. It's not a policing of your brethren. Even Judas turned to Christ and said, is it I? And Christ said, thou hast said it. But I believe this was said privately because I believe Judas is there next to Jesus. Because Judas goes out, and even, st even still then, no one knows why he went out. No one accuses him of being a betrayer. And this never really hit me until I think of the positive thinking. Why don't we do the same? Why don't we assume the best? Why don't we give people the benefit of the doubt, especially our fellow Christians, when something goes wrong? You know, why weren't they at services? Well, maybe they were drunk last night. Maybe this happened. Maybe that happened. Benefit of the doubt would be maybe their car broke down. We don't think that way. We get cynical. We get burn out, but maybe we should start thinking that way. Maybe we should start acting and thinking in a more loving manner. How is this commandment a new commandment? I know Wiersbe says that love would have new meaning and power, and I think there's a little bit to that. I read Cook's commentary. He said love would have a new motive and a new scope as far as the universal religion and love being preached, being established. But I think it's new because, what I've said before, the ultimate love would be demonstrated in sacrifice. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 7, and 8. The glory we read about in these passages, I believe Jesus is talking about a loving service and sacrifice. He glorified the Father by being a servant. He glorified the Father by suffering along with all of us. I have an extensive quote from uh, Bertocci, a philosopher of religion, and there's times when I read his work, I can't tell if he's a Christian or not. He, but he understands God in a broader sense as one who suffers along with us. Perhaps nothing makes God more worthy of worship than his willingness to become co-sufferer. It's the love of God which means self-sacrifice, self-limitation, and suffering for the sake of others. If God is the person who finds it worthwhile to suffer in order an increasing goodness may come into the world, then as we have said, religion as it ought to be must reflect that fact. True religion is never an escape from suffering or hardship. It's a fellowship in joy and suffering, for this is the basic purpose of religious living. To follow this new commandment, 
disciples have to love each other. Not just love each other. In one verse he says, love each other as I have loved you. We ought to love each other as he has loved us, that he gave himself. We should also give of ourselves. We talk about Sunday school uh, catchphrases. Joy is putting Jesus first, others next, and yourself last. Well, that's what we're talking about. It's not just for Sunday school, it's for all of us each day. I saw a church sign, God doesn't help others who help, or God doesn't help those who help themselves, he helps those who help others. And I think, I think God is glorified so much more in our helping of others than in the helping of ourselves. And I think that's the message that we're getting from this, regardless of that original phrase. Even John didn't mind being known as one who loved Jesus. Before the high priest, he said that he gained entrance because he was one who was associated with Jesus. He did not deny Jesus. Even there at Calvary, he stood as he was accused, as he was, as the sentence is being carried out, he stood. If it was a shameful thing in the eyes of the world to be a follower of Christ, he was willing to bear it because Christ bore that much more for you and for me and all mankind. And he did it all out of this great love that we're trying to put into human words and wrap our head around. I picked up a book, you may have heard of it, it's called Love Wins by Rob Bell, and I want to talk more about that warped idea of what love is. And sometimes when I hear the word love in a religious uh, discussion, I kind of roll my eyes or cringe a little bit because I feel that they're, you know, sacrificing truth for the sake of love. I didn't find what I was looking for, but I did have a lot to think about as far as defending the Christian faith. and talking about those sort of things without necessarily talking about hell. But I gained a more interesting story looking to the Jewish tradition of Kabbalah and some of the things the rabbis had written. There's a story that they tell about one man who tried to describe heaven and hell. And when he saw hell, he saw these big long lines of tables like what we just ate at not so long ago. And everyone had these spoons that were attached to their arms, but they were too long to reach their own mouths. And even though the tables were covered with food, these people were suffering because they were not able to feed themselves. And though they were blessed so greatly, they could not receive that kind of blessing. And when the same, whoever came up with this story, when they described heaven, the scene's the same. Everything's exactly the same, except for one key difference. They have the food, they have these long spoons that they can't reach their own mouths with, but they're feeding each other. I tell a story for two reasons. Well, more than that. I think it's a good way to talk about good and evil, righteous and wickedness to those who are outside the body of Christ. Because if anyone is in hell, if they don't want to accept the fact that a loving God could send people to that place, it's really our responsibility. It's our refusal to love God and man properly that would put a person in hell, that they would miss out on heaven if you want to put it in a different way. I also see the importance of love and fellowship, and I've always asked the question, what does John mean when he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness? Why is fellowship and forgiveness so important? And it's because of the love that Christ showed us and he commands us to live. I think yes, because of those things, if nothing else, it is that important. Judas left Christ's side, he went into the night and he went to his own place. But if anyone would want to learn more about God, would want to try to understand the love of God and that God is love. Then we have the opportunity here 
who recognized that Jesus is the Son of God, and he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it should not be a difficult thing for us to love one another and to love God. But also, if you will hear the message, believe, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of those sins, and be willing to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, then you have the opportunity. If one would stray far from the path who once committed themselves to God, but maybe strayed or has fallen away like Judas did, then we have the opportunity to come back to God and renew that love as we stand and as we sing. Wonderful story of love.